Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about information literacy in the space of generative AI. And this is something that I know is a hot topic in the research and education space. And for those that have already started this discussion, um, I'm going to put some links down below if you want to go and see what other voices are saying about this topic. So today, what I'm going to do is going through what I would consider a good foundation. Generative AI is changing rapidly and the way people use it and have access to it is also changing. So I am going to go over some foundational things that should apply no matter how it morphs, hopefully. Um, and I'm also going to talk about where it might be permissible to use generative AI in research and education and where we need to make sure we up the ante on our information literacy teachings to students and researchers so that they understand what's permissible and what's you know getting into a little dicey area all right so if this sounds interesting to you make sure you stick around all right so let's start off with what is information literacy in general so it is the practice of teaching how to be literate about the information that you are presented with and things that would be included in this are when you're looking at things and i'm going to put the generative ai spin on these when you are looking at materials written images uh video sound any any materials uh how can you tell that where they came from or who made them or what went into creating them, right? Like the, the ethical considerations that are a part of these things. And how is this appropriate to use? Can you cite it? And more importantly, and I think this is the, the main thing that I would consider part of information literacy is, is it something that is evidence-based? Is it something that is founded in other research or in experiments and things that will prove out something is accurate or not. Accurate doesn't mean truthful, right? There, there is a difference. Um, there's a lot of things that in the research space will say, you know, vitamin C causes cancer and you'll find a bunch of other stuff that says it's, it solves cancer, right? Like that's just an example. Um, but that's why uh, truthfulness is, is not really something that's gonna be covered here. That's something that as part of information literacy, you have to understand the data points of the information that you are consuming and then make the determination on your own whether you're going to take that as truth or not. You can, however, determine if it's evidence-based and then you can go yourself and dig into that evidence. So let's dive into five steps that you can take to assess generative AI. And by the way, this is something I would highly encourage you to go over with your staff, your students, your educators, your um, tutors, anybody that is dealing in the research and academic space, the education space, I would highly recommend looking into, you know, what I'm going through here, but also other voices that are starting to tackle this topic. All right, so let's go into step one, which is, do you know where this information came from or who published it? I have noticed that uh, some researchers are listing uh, ChatGPT or other AI in the author section, which is ridiculous. Um, something else that's come out recently is, at least in the US, um, AI has not been deemed human and therefore you can't copyright art that ge generative AI creates. And that also means that um, the works that it writes cannot be copywritten. You have to have a prompt from a human, right? And the data that's going into them is also from humans. And so therefore, uh, because there's so much human in the loop, the, the machine is not coming up with these prompts themselves. They're not creative enough to come up with some of these things on their own. Um, that's why, at least for now, in the legal space, at least in the US, uh, anything that is created from generative AI is not copywritten and cannot be listed as an author. It shouldn't be. So if you see that on some publications, maybe reach out to those publishers and ask, what's up with that? Because it shouldn't be there. When you are looking at generative AI, if you can't really tell where it came from or who published it, and yes, you can list ChatGPT or the actual model um, that you are using, that's at least one step. But if you can't pinpoint where some of these data points in the responses are coming from, 
chances are it's not citable and therefore you can use it as a stepping stone and a way to inform yourself but that means you probably shouldn't be using it um, as a source in your educational material and if you're doing research you want to make sure you go and back up those claims which we're going to get to in a later step here so in a way it's sort of like the wiki data argument that's been happening in uh schools and education and research facilities for quite some time and that is it's a great place to start. It's a good place to understand the different facets of maybe the topic that you're investigating. Maybe it helps you understand if that's the research topic you wanna take on. Um, but outside of that, you're still going to need to go out and you know discover your own sources, assemble an argument, do the research and get that evidence for your paper. All of that is something that you as the researcher or the student or the educator has to do and so again like you're not going to cite wikipedia in any of those kinds of materials same with generative ai you're not going to say that this is your your source of truth because you have to then back it up with your own evidence and finding citable sources that are also evidence-based the next is knowing your author generative ai is authored by a model but what the model is actually doing is it's taking a lot of different materials. And if you're interested in how generative AI works, I'll put a link up above so you can check that out. But it's basically taking all the research, all the images, all the videos, all the things out there that it has available to it. And that's the other thing, you don't really know what it had available when it was being trained. So maybe a bunch of stuff that is scholarly research that's behind paywalls, probably wasn't used and so it's got a lot of missing gaps in its understanding because when that information goes into the generative model it's basically like putting it into a blender and then at the end you might have a really delicious amazing smoothie but you really don't know where the special ingredient came from you don't know in what measurements it was given and so it's a lot of guesswork. And that's why, again, there's no real author involved with generative AI. And the model itself is not authoring anything. It is deriving things from everything that has been given to the model. And that's usually does have authors, but there's no provenance. So you don't know who those authors might be. The next is how current is this information? That is a really big flag with most generative AI. It's a model and it's trained on a lot of material. That material can be going back for a very uh, long length of time and it's a point in time too. So if it was trained on models that are six months old, your answers are gonna be six months old. And so depending on what you're researching or what you're writing about, that might be too old. And so if you're looking at regular research, you always want to, again, depending on the discipline, it's going to be a different cutoff, but for things that change rapidly, like in technology, you don't usually want to use a lot of materials that are past two years old. Again, there's some foundational things, right? Like the, the be all end all paper that, you know, talked about this one thing in, you know, 1968 or whatever it is, those are still valid, right, to use. But um, because so many things are changing and things are getting rewritten and, and findings are, are, you know, expanding the knowledge on certain topics, two years is a good cutoff. If you're doing things in like economics or legal or, or history or any of those things, the, the length of time is, is longer. But the fact of the matter is on the generative AI space, you don't know how old any one piece of that answer is. And so when you're going in and you're double checking, because that's going to be another point on this list, you really do need to understand how old is that information? Is it still relevant? Does it apply to your discipline in the way that you're anticipating? These things have to be go gone over by discipline specific educators uh, so make sure that the students and researchers really understand this. And along with that is, um, is what the response giving you, is it, is it founded in evidence? Is, is it building on the shoulders of giants as Google Scholar says, um, you know, if there's enough open source research out there, perhaps. Um, but there's a whole lot of data that's not really out there for crawling, which is where most of the generative AI training sets come from. 
And so again, not only is it going to have holes in its logic, but you really can't tell if this is something coming from a random blog or a conspiracy site, or is it coming from an authoritative, research, evidence-based, reviewed article? Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of problems with biases and, you know, the ivory towers and all of those other things um, that go into the publishing space as well. Don't get me wrong. I'm not glossing over that, but at least it's kind of a known entity and, and there is rigor there in understanding if something is evidence-based or not. And I'll put some links down below for folks that are uh, using generative AI in research to craft data sets where they shouldn't be. Um, it's, it's tempting. And that's why we need to talk about what it is used for and what it should not be used for. Um, and again, not glossing over other issues in the publishing space, like publish or perish, which may be one of the reasons that people are resorting to unethical practices. But again, that's a whole different video, but I'm just noting it here because I want you to be aware that I'm aware of some of those other things going on, but understanding if something is evidence-based goes into the next piece, which is, can you triangulate, which is a common practice in research what these answers are. So just because you find one mention of this, this thing online that the generative AI has given you, doesn't mean it's evidence-based, doesn't mean that you should be able to use that. The best practice is to try to either recreate it, right? So repeatable, um, recreating the um, experiments to actually find out if it's accurate or not, or trying to find other sources that have done something similar or have come to the same types of conclusions or have cross-sided each other. Again, cross-siding has some of its own issues, but again, that's for a different video. Um, so these are some of the ways that you can, you know, understand what you're actually looking at and how much of it you can take um, at face value. And, and I think the response here is you can't take any of it at face value. You really do need to make sure that you go in and do your due diligence and you understand what you're actually consuming, what you are actually being influenced by, and what you may or may not be able to cite from what you are gathering. Because there's been a lot of things like the lawyers, for instance, I'll, I'll put this link down below. Um, there's a great video on, on this uh, story where lawyers were using ChatGPT to create a case for a legal proceeding and ChatGPT basically made up uh, precedents uh, with other cases. So check the facts, right? Check, check what you're looking at. And again, might not even be a fact. It might actually just mean that it exists. Um, and then you need to determine if it's factual or if you can then further corroborate what even the secondary source that you're finding um, is is noting because you know there's that difference between primary and secondary sources where primary is the thing that that is the first right so this is usually the experiment or the um, the tablet uh, from ancient times that said this thing if you're doing history um, the primary documents and then there's the secondary which is then using that information and assessing it and analyzing it and making arguments on it. So most of the time you need to find um, one, if not both of those to corroborate some of the things that you are finding in research, whether it's from generative AI or not. So in this same vein, when you're doing things in more traditional research and education, you're going to have a lit review or you're going to have a bibliography or something that goes through and identifies who else out there has said something similar or has um, s done things in this space? So if you need to reach out um, and you need to really understand what others have done, um, usually you have a source to understand that from. With generative AI, they don't have that. And so, you know, these are the things that would either need to be improved with generative AI so that they can be used um, more in the education and scholarly space um, for gathering evidence. But the other thing that people are using it for is starting to write. And again, as long as you use that, again, this is, this is my professional opinion, that 80-20 rule, um, sometimes you really need to just have clay on the table. You need to have something on the page so you have something to react to 
and to, um, you know, hook in your own research and to make sure that you can, you know, not just stare at a blank page for hours on end. We've all been there. So I think that's where generative AI is, is going to be helpful, helping students understand maybe, maybe different sentence structures and maybe different sources they, they could go and look into to use in their research. I think those are all good ways to use the generative AI in education and in research. But if you are using it past that to actually do the research, guess what? AI and machine learning has been used in research for a while now. So as long as you are citing, I use this generative model and, you know, this is the version I used and here's how I used it, you know, so that others can recreate the um, experiment that you've done and that you are very explicitly calling out, here's where I used AI, here's where I used ML. That citation structure, that, that um, pattern already exists in education and research. And it's totally legit, but you have to make sure that you're doing it responsibly. And that's where you have to go into, you know, the ethics of AI and making sure you clear things with your IRB board. And if you don't have an IRB board, which is usually an institutional review board that looks at the um, uh, humane treatment of subjects in research, um, and the ethical considerations around it and making sure you're following good research practices. If you work at a lab or you work somewhere where there isn't an IRB, there are tons of IRB websites for universities. So pick your university, go look at their IRB site. You might even be able to do training with their IRB uh, training because most researchers at institutions have to go through that and get IRB certified. Try that out um, because that is really going to help you understand what you're looking at and making sure you're not making any missteps in your own education, your own research, and making sure that you're using models that are also ethical and, and not going to be harming anybody. So that is um, my, my summary of some tips that I would suggest, how these hook into how information literacy typically works and how we can use that uh, process even in the generative AI space. And this area is going to constantly change. So I might have to do a part two of this when more things develop in, in the AI space. So if this is helpful to you, um, please leave a comment down below. I would love to hear your stories about this, hear what you're using to teach your students or your educators, your researchers on what and how to do things with generative AI, how to um, assess things that are being created by generative AI, or this is the other part, um, assessing if it was made from generative AI because not everybody's calling it out. So that's the other thing that we have to watch out for, but there's a lot of um, you know, plagiarism type uh, tooling and software that's also coming up uh, behind all this generative AI stuff to help determine when something is generative or not. All right, uh, so with that, I hope this video has been helpful. Please leave a comment down below if I missed anything. And with that, I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.